primarily in the academic setting. Uh, I'm the Division Director of General Pediatrics at the University of Colorado uh, and Children's Hospital of Colorado. Uh, my primary academic interest, uh, as well as from a quality and programming standpoint, um, is in improving the uh, interface between primary and specialty care. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Can everyone see the slides? Alex, are those up now? Yep, it looks fantastic. Thank you. Okay, great, great. So you, you may have seen this picture of the maroon bells near Aspen many times. It's on a lot of Colorado travel posters. This little red line that I added is actually the easiest climbing route uh, up one of the maroon bells, uh, and probably a more difficult route than I would do normally, but um, I just couldn't resist uh, being a hiker. Um, it's, uh, it involves an awful lot of rock, some steep uh, fall potential, stuff like that. Uh, and I think when we're talking about primary care and specialty care co-management, uh, we probably wouldn't fall to our deaths, but it's certainly a big challenge and one of the largest challenges that we have um, as uh, pediatricians and uh, other child health providers to collaborate with one another. This particular route, being the easiest route on the mountain, is also called Class 4 Climbing, uh, defined as where hiking ends and climbing begins. Uh, the terrain is steep, dangerous, and some routes can be done without a rope, but usually you need a rope. Uh, for us, the rope is the connection that we have between one another and the community of providers, including parents and community uh, resources, um, to help, help us take care of kids with autism spectrum disorder. Before I dive in, I wanted to provide some definitions. Um, some people use them interchangeably, but I think there are some important distinctions. Um, for me, communication is sort of the basic. It, it means talking together. Uh, together meaning in both directions. Um, communication isn't really there when you only have it going from PCP to specialist or family to PCP or something like that. Um, it means talking all together. If we are all together, it's easier to collaborate, which is to start to do some work together. Um, and then the final, uh, if any of you notice the holy grail on the bottom of the slide, is co-management, meaning integrating our work. Not just working together, uh, but really making our work as efficient and effective for families as possible, uh, as well as integrating families into the equation. So I wanted to present a case, not a real case, but probably a case that many of you um, have experienced in one way or another during your careers. Um, and I need to get rid of this thing on the right. Um, well, anyway, all right, I will read this slide to the extent that I can. Um, Jeremy is is beautiful kid. Uh, he's new to your practice, in, assuming you're a primary care provider or even a specialist, but this is a PCP uh, directed um, case. He's new from a rural area out of state. He's had some developmental delays during his lifetime, mainly in the area of language and social skills. He has related behavior problems and a few hard to characterize medical problems, including severe constipation since the age of about one. And Jeremy's family has Medicaid insurance. Jeremy's parents ask you if he might have autism because he's never been formally diagnosed, but they've been having a hard time getting him evaluated and diagnosed because they've been a long way from a referral center um, and there are no places close to their hometown that can make the definitive diagnosis of autism. He does have an IEP, uh, but his services have been limited so far because the school requires a clear diagnosis. He is on the waiting list for a full developmental evaluation, but he's been on that waiting list for greater than six months because at your particular center, there's a priority for evaluating kids who are three years old and under. Jeremy, unfortunately, also has had some increased meltdowns coping with school. He's in a, a new school in the first grade, goes to, to there for a full day, and class sizes are bigger. And his meltdowns do seem worse uh, if his constipation gets worse. Looking at Jeremy's chart and reviewing his history more, his growth has been great. Um, however, uh, getting appropriate uh, variety of foods into him has, has been difficult. He eats mostly French fries and chicken nuggets, this sounds familiar, um, greater than any other food. Um, 
Jeremy's physical strength and the severity of his outbursts have been increasing since he started first grade. And his parents have been really searching hard. However, they have not been able to obtain behavioral therapy that is either useful to them or affordable or both. Uh, just after, despite almost, uh, or actually more than a year of searching, um, places will say, we don't treat autism here, or we don't have the people to treat autism here. Uh, they also say we prioritize kids under three. So the parents really feel stuck and are asking you, what can you do to help? So let's take a step back. Um, think about kids who, the population of kids with autism. Well, autism affects about 1% of kids. Congenital heart disease also affects about 1% of kids. And both require specialty and other resources beyond the primary care setting. But imagine a situation, if you're a clinician in primary care practice, or even any kind of clinician, in which a six-year-old with newly suspected congenital heart disease had to wait more than six months to get diagnosed, and then after that had no access to a source of effective evidence-based treatment just because he's greater than six. This is not a situation that any of us would tolerate. And then further, imagine once Jeremy was finally diagnosed and recommendations for treatment were made, his potential care providers disagreed on whether they uh, were, uh, sorry, it was within their wheelhouse to treat him and leaving his family where to go next. Uh, no, it's not my responsibility. It's not my responsibility. Why don't you try somebody else? Uh, incredibly frustrating and an incredible trust breaker between his family, his primary care provider, and his specialist. So many of us have children in our practices, whether it's a primary care or a specialty practice, uh, with autism who have been through variations of this theme. Now, you know, this is maybe a little bit more extreme, but not a lot more extreme than many of us experience on a regular basis. So we really have some problems here. Taking a family-centered approach, let's think for a second about what Jeremy needs. He needs a diagnosis. He may need more than one diagnosis, but at least he needs a primary developmental and behavioral diagnosis. He may need some other medical diagnoses. Uh, you're probably, as a, a clinician, a little bit better at providing those um, more easily. He also needs treatment recommendations, more than just a diagnosis. Where can parents start and how can they access whatever that treatment is in their community? Once these recommendations are made, he needs a care plan developed jointly uh, between his family and all of his providers um, with some accountability. Who's going to do what? Uh, when are they going to do it? Um, what happens if it doesn't get done? Um, ideally, also, Jeremy needs some real warm linkages, uh, warm handoffs, as they call them in, in the inpatient quality improvement world, which is, I think is a good way to do it. Uh, people talking to one another, people communicating, uh, and, and figuring out how they are going to co-manage uh, what Jeremy needs. And then finally, Jeremy needs a follow-up plan um, for what's going to happen next, what's going to happen over the next few months, maybe a year. So as Jeremy's primary care provider, put yourself in that place for a moment, if you will, um, you need a few things, too. You need some guidance about when to refer Jeremy for different things and for what. Um, you probably feel more comfortable with the medical end of that, but not so comfortable with the behavioral end of that. You need some knowledge of what a primary care provider might do. You can manage his constipation for sure. Um, you can probably co-manage some of his other issues with help. You need specialty care that is not only supportive and accessible to the family, but supportive and accessible to you, so you can learn better um, how to help Jeremy and his family um, and how to learn about more kids like Jeremy that you will certainly experience in the next few months. Um, you need support for some of the things that are on the borderline for primary care, maybe insomnia, uh, maybe just a couple of behavioral things. Um, and finally, you need connection to community resources. Um, you may not be able to do all this yourself. You may uh, have the luxury of having someone who can do some care coordination in your practice. Um, you need uh, some knowledge or knowledge of knowledge of people who know educational and behavioral treatment uh, and community supports. So you need a few things. You need a, a basically a playbook and some partners. Next slide. So just to think, um, 
if you, any of you who are primary care clinicians or specialty clinicians, just to sort of to think among yourselves and maybe for our discussion later, what's the climate in your current clinical environment of collaboration and maybe even co-management between primary care providers and specialty providers? And when I say specialty providers, I, I, I mean that broadly. Uh, developmental specialists, mental health providers, uh, and community resource partners in schools. Okay. I'm going to go away from Jeremy's case now and go to a little bit of theory about co-management just briefly. Um, how do you engage care partners? I don't know who's the primary care provider, who's the specialist here, uh, or who, who is what, but it's an intriguing uh, thing to think about. Um, why is co-management important? Uh, why can't one provider do it all, or why can't uh, parents uh, look at one look to one provider sometimes and another provider sometimes? Well, parents and kids and patients in general see the whole package, uh, and they expect the whole package to work together. Um, they do coordination because they have to, uh, but they really uh, expect everybody to work together. Um, but the current system, as we know, is pretty well siloed. Um, and specialty care, especially developmental evaluation uh, and behavioral health, can be a lot harder to access. However, primary care providers can and want to participate in care, um, even if there's some distance. Um, you know, in the electronic world, the distance means less and less. Uh, they can monitor uh, patients and families. They can care for patients and families with some support. Um, there's, I'll talk about a couple examples uh, in a few slides. And everyone. Uh, gains confidence, everyone learns together, and everyone worries less. Furthermore, uh, if there's good primary care access, and uh, you can identify problems and treat them earlier, um, so unmet needs can be fewer and shorter. Let's break down some of the ideas of co-management just for a minute um, and into, well, task groups, if not individual tasks. Um, first, there needs to be a culture, which is one of the hardest things. Um, people need to be willing and able to participate. They do have to communicate, and communication lines need to be open. Um, going along with communication and the culture, um, then you can develop a partnership um, and shared ideas and shared tasks. Um, that often requires a period of time where you kind of negotiate back and forth. Hopefully the family's uh, included in that negotiation uh, and division of responsibilities. Um, with my best partnerships uh, in some of our clinics here, the families actually have uh, identified tasks um, that we make explicit um, at the time of visits. There needs to be agreement not just at the beginning, but as time goes on and for periodic monitoring of that agreement, just to make sure that everybody is still able to do um, and, and interested in doing uh, what they set out to do at the beginning. Um, and there needs to be accountability, too. And, and you know, that doesn't need to be, you know, anything that involves sort of shame if you don't do something. Uh, but there needs to be uh, clarity on who's going to do what by when, uh, which should be part of the care plan. And remember what isn't there with Jeremy at the beginning uh, is trust to make sure that all of these things are going to happen. So a lot of times if you're a lead clinician at the beginning, um, whether you're a primary care or a specialty clinician, um, you need to spend some time building some trust with patients like Jeremy and his family. Primary care practices, thinking more now going from the clinician view to the system view. Um, they need information, communication. They need efficiency. Um, so ways to communicate with one another that might involve uh, a back line or a designated care manager um, if the clinician's busy. For example, a, uh, a, clip, a uh, nurse or someone else in the practice that can um, provide a little bit of a bridge for care management. The, the pathways uh, that you all have developed as part of the Autism Treatment Network for insomnia and constipation uh, are actually really good examples of how to make the, the crazy a little bit more efficient. Um, and I think these are really fabulous examples that can be extended to other things uh, over time. I, I, I think they're wonderful. Um, Primary care practices and clinicians need to feel valued, uh, as do families with what they know. Um, and also, most importantly, um, or at least equally as importantly, is support from peers um, to support this. And this is one of the reasons 
the, the, the pair support issue uh, is one of the reasons why the system doesn't work very well for autism. Specialty practices need some things too. They also need information and communication. They need continued engagement of the primary care provider. Many of our specialists, uh, both here and other places that I've been, uh, will tell me that even motivated primary care providers will be engaged at the beginning when there's an acute problem and a reason for referral. But then over time, they kind of get busy or I don't know if they lose interest or, or figure that the system will take care of itself. But they need continued uh, engagement over time, especially if problems start to crop up. Uh, they need to be available. And specialty practices, uh, all practitioners also tell me they need to feel valued. Uh, getting the same question a hundred times uh, from a primary care clinician, even though they're busy, makes it seem like they're not listening. Uh, and that tends to turn specialists off to collaboration. So now we're talking about a little, a little more in the way of tasks. Um, these are some things you can do at the personal level. Um, initiate communication. It matters a whole lot. Uh, just reach out, whether it's an email, uh, a phone call, or, or something quick, uh, to say, hey, I'm here, this is how to get in, in touch with me. And that can happen on either end. Uh, encouraging communication, um, call me anytime, uh, is actually a really powerful thing to be able to, to say. Um, ask questions and encourage questions back and forth. Um, propose roles. Uh, if, if they're not right, um, make it OK to say, no, I don't want to do this. Um, and again, including families as partners is, is really important um, to, uh, to the whole co-management thing. At the system level, uh, more and more electronic records are talking to one another, which is great. Um, a few years ago, we were pretty pessimistic that this would happen. And now it's still hard, uh, but it's happening more and more. Uh, that's good. Uh, on the other hand, people need to know where to find the information in the electronic record. Uh, which isn't always assumed. Um, if EMRs don't work, faxes work too. They're just less efficient. Um, the idea of having phone contact is still important, uh, even with sophisticated EMR systems, uh, because there are some things that are just better talked about um, than uh, communicated by electronic uh, means. And not all consultations need to be face-to-face. -face. You know, some, some can be phone, some can be email. Uh, but you sort of get what, used to one another's style after a while. Um, if you have a care coordinator who can help, make that known to the people who you're talking to, because they may not have a care coordinator. Um, and you may, able to, may be able to share that for your shared patients. Um, that can make a world of difference uh, to the other side who may um, you know, not have as many resources. On the other hand, uh, if you're a PCP or someone who doesn't have too many resources, it's OK to ask the specialist, hey, do you have somebody who can kind of help us figure up this all out. Uh, and they may very well have that. I think one thing that sort of underlies all this uh, is Judy Palfrey's idea of a tight web of consultants uh, in her description of the, their complex care program at Children's Hospital in Boston. Um, that was one of the things that was really key to good co-management, is people knowing one another, um, which can never replace electronic uh, supports. Here's a couple of examples. Um, feel free to contact me. Da, da, da. I look forward to working together. Um, if you're a specialist uh, who ha has some knowledge in a particular technical area, or if you're a primary care provider who really knows the family well, um, it's really important to say, you know, hey, I have learned that. Da, da, da. Um, so uh, that can help. And it can really uh, go a long way in helping families uh, know that you know them and that you know the situation. Proposing roles, I think, is important. One of the things that often are missing from communication between primary care and specialty clinicians are, uh, I will do this. Um, a lot of times you just hear something, something should be done. And we all agree on that, but who's going to do it? Um, so it's OK and, and really important to propose roles. Um, Again, agreement and making plans and collaboration with parents is important. Parents may have a better relationship built up with one clinician than another. They, there may be more resources uh, in their community um, from time to time. So uh, putting, putting parents' decision making into this loop is really, really important. Here's an example uh, that um, Ann uh, Reynolds shared with me as uh, something that happens in genetics uh, here. Um, 
some actually their template from their consultation was developed, which is was really I think fairly groundbreaking, although very simple. Is what are we going to do? What would the, what should the PCP do? Um, and what should the family do? Um, so this is good. The only issue is it's a little bit unclear from the letters as about whether the family and the primary care provider have agreed to the plan. Um, if, for example, you're a primary care provider uh, at some distance from a, a capable, competent uh, child-focused center, uh, a cranial MRI might not be something you can do in the community, um, for example. And then finally, you know, the ongoing communication, I like to call it service after the sale. Um, a trial of something has been largely su successful or not uh, to, to help talk about what progress is being made or not being made. Um, and um, then finally, the feedback needs to be timely. Um, it's okay, you know, to if you have a very long, if you're, say, a developmental specialist who's going to send a 15-page report, that takes some time to generate. Um, but a quick one-pager or even a one-paragrapher uh, really can go a long way toward an initial plan. And uh, say if you're a developmental specialist who's listening in today, um, if the child goes back to the primary care um, provider the next week, the family is going to sort of want to know, okay, now what? Um, and anything you can do to make that known to both the PCP and the parents, even if it's not complete, is really, really important. Um, I just wanted to reemphasize, you know, I've talked about how important the role of parent, parents, patients, families is, but, um, and it's important to include them in communication, but don't leave them responsible is the only way. Um, there have been a couple of studies that, that we did a few years ago that showed that really parents uh, fill in a gap that's too large in communication between primary care and subspecialty uh, providers. Encourage their participation. Giving them things to do is not a burden um, most of the time, although you sort of have to assess that for each individual family. Um, and the more you can make the team members' roles explicit to the family, the more you can make it explicit to yourself, too. Um, I don't know if, if you have this experience, but I always find, okay, well, yeah, maybe I'll do this. And, uh, well, if I commit to a family that I'm going to do something, that makes it a lot more likely that I'm actually going to do it. Here's an example uh, taking from behavioral health um, of something that they've been able to implement pretty well in Massachusetts uh, called the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Project. Um, I don't know if it's changed name recently. I, I believe it's still the same thing. Um, but it, it's an example of something that can go from a, a, an area that was quite siloed to an area that uh, some real co-management has the potential to happen. Um, I won't go into the details, uh, but they developed a program that is now statewide where primary care um, clinicians can have telephone access to mental health clinicians during business hours with a guaranteed response time. Um, to get some advice about cases and ideas about whether kids might need to be referred uh, for a behavioral health specialty consult or whether this is something that might be manageable in the, within the primary care setting. Um, advice is always provided and the option for an in-person visit uh, sometimes is there uh, depending on, on where and when uh, within the state uh, the consultation happens. One thing that is consistent is ongoing phone support for problems. Um, even if it's something that the PCP manages in their office, they can still get some phone support if they need it. And then the other thing that's extremely valuable that was actually developed after the first few years of the project is care coordination services uh, from the MCPAP project to connect families to community mental health services. And families have seen that as, as a very important thing. So here's an idea about applying this to what you might be doing uh, for care of autism um, with sort of maybe an end of one kind of study. Try it once. Um, if you're a specialist, you might want to find a, primary, a friendly primary care clinician. If you're a primary care clinician, you might want to find one specialist that you've worked with in the past. Um, if you don't know anyone, maybe you could talk to your physician relations office at your local hospital but hopefully you've worked with someone in the past uh, having to do 
uh, with a, a shared patient with autism. Um, the next idea might be to address one need, uh, whether it's constipation, working together to find some behavioral services, something, um, and think about including community partners in this search if it's appropriate. Um, finally, uh, giving one another your phone contact information um, and reassurance that you will continue to be involved in the care of this patient. Um, for the, you know, the PCPs in the audience, don't refer and run. For the specialists, don't say you're available and then not be available. Um, it's important to, to do both. So think about that, maybe in a context uh, of a kid like Jeremy. Um, one of the reasons I was sort of excited uh, to do this presentation today is because it's so hard for autism within the system that we have. Um, community services are not as together as they are often with other conditions. Uh, they're often just not there uh, in a particular town, especially behavioral services. Um, and the other thing is, as soon as you get the, the way to do it down with one kid, uh, since autism is such a big spectrum, uh, every kid's needs are different, so you're constantly learning. From a payer standpoint, revenue is hard to come by. Um, this is not a procedure. This is not something that can generate revenue that can subsidize other things, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in terms of establishing a scope of practice, uh, for, it varies a lot from community to community, and, and sometimes even within communities, from town to town, based on what community supports are available. So this is hard. This is class four climbing, or maybe even be class five where you need a rope all the time. Um, so um, just a few more ideas. We're, we're almost done with the presentation part, and we'll have plenty of time uh, for discussions, which is good. Um, a little bit of face-to-face -face meeting can be helpful. Um, our state AAP chapter had its annual meeting this past spring, um, and uh, Ann Reynolds and a couple of other clinicians uh, from our ATN site went, um, and it was just great uh, to have them there to meet pediatricians in the community uh, and talk about uh, shared challenges. Um, stuff like that is, is very, very useful. Um, whether you're a PCP or a specialist, becoming really familiar with the resources in your community, whether it's at the, the town level, the county level, uh, or some combination, um, whether there are state level resources that you might be able to access by phone. Um, if there's somebody, with, whether within your practice or, or somehow, uh, who can be a care coordinator, even part-time, um, this can make a huge difference. And eventually, once you sort of get the lay of the land, this is maybe a year two thing, uh, is to develop some agreements. Uh, you know, generally I will, say you're a specialist, I'll try and see, you know, new kids within three months. Um, and you will um, try and do as much with the constipation as you can before you call me back, just as an example. Um, and then combining this with individual care plans uh, where families can get involved is good too. When I presented this in June, uh, Megan Guinea, I, I hope I got her name right, uh, in, at NICHQ had a great idea um, just to do a quick uh, PDSA cycle. Um, this is, I've talked about this a little bit in the last few minutes, um, but uh, if you're a specialist, find a PCP partner and get their advice about how you can best help. What's the one thing that you wish I could do most? Um, then use that as a focus for co-management for one patient, one time. It won't take you too long. Um, once you've done that uh, as your PDSA cycle, then think about, okay, what to do next? How can you continue to support one another? Um, if you're a PCP who's a little bit motivated, um, to uh, do maybe a little more than uh, care for your individual kids with autism, how can you spread the word about this partnership to your community? And how can parents help? How can they help spread the word? And how can they help you find resources? Because if there's one thing that the parents are really, really good at as a group generally, it's finding resources for their kids. So continuing the idea of PDSA cycles, here's some change ideas. Um, one is, you know, find one care partner like we talked about. Um, also, a sort of a not totally one child focused, um, 
if you can think a little bit more broadly about the system, what's one issue that you can start to work on with your care partner uh, that might cut across kids? A um, little harder might be becoming a resource. That takes time, a year or two, maybe more than that. Um, and then finally, you start to talk about advocacy with a big A. Um, and can, are there some leaders in your community? Are there some parent groups? Um, are there some people that are already doing work on this that you could join uh, to help to advocate uh, for resources to, to increase met needs and reduce gaps? So we're just about done. Um, here's some questions that we could discuss potentially in the next few minutes. Um, what bridges do you currently have? What are bridges that might extend across your county lines, state lines that you'd be interested in sharing with one another? Um, what care coordination resources, think, think about this, do you have or that you might have access to through others? Um, what's your engagement uh, like now? Do you have some? Do you have any? Uh, between primary care clinician practices, practice groups, uh, and specialty groups, um, and referral centers, um, and community partners. And then think about maybe one thing you could do to make each of these better. Uh, write it down, share it with us. Uh, share it with one another, um, and think about that. Uh, in conclusion, ours has almost a million pieces. Uh, if you say 1%, maybe a million folks with autism in the country, it's an important problem, obviously, uh, with that number. Um, and hopefully we can help make some headway with this. And, and uh, I applaud the work of the ATN group uh, to try and start this um, very long journey. So thanks, and I am done. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, always a, a stimulating presentation. And uh, at this point, we do want to open up the line so that others can uh, ask some questions and get our discussion going here. Alex, do we have folks um, un off the mute now? I will be unmuting in just a moment here so that everyone can join in. So one of the things that uh, Chris mentioned was developing a culture of participation and collaboration that may not be present in your, uh, in your area. Um, other suggestions about helping to develop that? I've heard of some practices uh, or some specialists doing a version of academic detailing and going out and visiting practices so that there is that personal connection. If you have a question, if you could raise your hand and I'll unmute you, that would be really wonderful. Thank you. We have a hand raised from Arnold yes. Bierenbaum. Um, yes. Um, as the Affordable Care Act increases the number of people seeking primary care, will it become possible for specialists to uh, find primary care providers since they appear that they will be very, very busy in, in the future? Yeah, good question. You know, um, I think the, the answer is going to vary to a certain extent from state to state, uh, but due largely to SCHIP and, and kids' eligibility for Medicaid, um, as well as the fact that the primary care supply in pediatrics is somewhat better uh, at baseline than adults, um, we're not anticipating that that's going to be a big problem. Of course, time will tell. Um, you know, and in some states there still have been a lot of uninsured kids. Um, but so far, um, people are not anticipating the crisis that they are in adult care. Excellent. Thank you. Are there other questions from our group here? 
Chris, with that example that you showed with uh, Ann Reynolds' case, there are a couple of other parts of that that, that help um, prod the specialist and the primary care provider to start sharing that care. Uh, for example, in that example, the geneticist was going to order some specific genetic-oriented tests, but they were going to have the primary care doctor manage some other uh, consultations or tests that, according to some care plans, it may be that the primary care provider is the only one who can order those tests or initiate those consultations. So that's another way of collaborating and taking advantage of a natural situation that, that may exist for that family. Right. Uh, it can get a little bit tricky, um, especially if you have, for example, uh, like we have here, we have rural primary care providers who, for insurance purposes, have to do all the authorization but really can access things like uh, subspecialty consultation and um, high-cost imaging services in their communities. So that often requires a couple of tricky phone calls back and forth, but, but usually it gets done. And if you have lines of communication open, it gets done that much faster. Any other uh, questions out there or comments? Would anyone like to go out on a limb and think about one PDSA cycle, one idea, one thing that works well for them that they'd like to share with other people? I don't want to pick on anybody, but I see Louise Iwashi on the call, and it's hard for me to believe <laughs> that she doesn't have a comment here. Um. Robert Nickel, um, he has a, a comment um, that he recommends that every PCP who wants to start building their autism resources start with the Autism Society of America chapter in their community, and they are okay. generally a comprehensive resource. Um, and he's also unmuted if you'd like to add anything to that. Yes, I need to say this is Tamara Bakewell. I am sitting in for Robert right now. He is close by, but let me sit in on that. I work with the Family to Family Health Information Center and parent of a child with autism. So thank you for letting me hop in. Yeah, I, I think it's important. You know, the, the great thing is, um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Autism Speaks has a chapter in every state. Uh, there are many other um, autism-specific and, and non-autism-specific groups like Family Voices. Um, and uh, so they can be just incredibly valuable links to resources. If the Bob, I'm sorry. If the Bob replacement wants to say something about what people, parent-to-parent -parent health information centers are and how they can be useful. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. There's one in every state. They are funded by um, HRSA, uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau. We are funded to provide family-to-family uh, -family, um, navigation, system navigation for families of kids with all kinds of uh, disabilities and special needs, not just autism. Um, and they're easy to locate just by Googling family-to-family -family health information centers, and we could direct you to the right spot. Thank you. So your homework Hello? is a clinician to go to that website. <laughs> While we have our parent on the, on the line here, if I could ask another question. One of uh, Chris's slides was addressing engaging families in development of the care plan as active partners. Uh, do you have any uh, recommendations on how we can help engage the families uh, in developing treatment plans, for example. Oh well, thanks for uh, thanks for asking. I think that slide was right on. Thank you so much for including that as a slide uh, that got its own attention. It wasn't just fit in there; it was called out. So thank you. Um, I think a, a simple statement you can never go wrong with is how does that sound to you um, when developing a care plan? You know, we're looking at X, Y, and Z. How does that sound to you? Um, understanding that parents are sometimes weary dealing with extreme behaviors, that they may say that it sounds good to them, but the follow-through may be tough because 
-hmm. of exhaustion because of resources. Because if we live in, you know, one side of the state and the the diagnostic centers on the other side of the state, it might be more than we can manage. So I think um, engaging us, asking, does this seem doable? Um, you know, we've even asked families if 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 we gave you a prescription today, would you have any trouble filling it? Um, you know, just just asking. Um, I don't know a parent that is not wanting to um, be involved in the care plan for their child. Sometimes, though, we don't always say the barriers that we feel. And so, you know, be patient with families. That might take a little bit of prompting, a little bit of drawing, because we've got a lot. <laughs> we've got a lot going on, and it's hard to. Uh, we want to do it all, but sometimes it's difficult. So be patient and keep trying to engage with us, and I think it will work. That's just my humble opinion. Great. Well, I appreciate your thoughts. Um, I did ask Louise if she would comment, and I think she has her hand raised, so perhaps we can unmute Louise now. Aloha. <laughs> if you all. Um, I'm calling Hello. from Hawaii, and actually we have been um, very active uh, here in Hawaii um, uh, related to addressing, I think, both the earlier callers, um, the whole um, health care reform issues, and patient-centered uh, medical care. And as an example, um, in terms of trying to get primary care docs um, um, with, and working well with their subspecialists, uh, we have in Hawaii got approval from the American Academy of Pediatrics for a um, MCO, a man, um, the maintenance um, you know, certification for medical home. And what we're really striving to do is getting our primary care docs comfortable with things like, P, you know, the, the PDA, the SA cycles and all, and also working with our kids with special needs. And so one of the efforts that's going on right now is to be able to do real-time linking with our electronic medical records um, in terms of incentivizing that for our families that real-time ability to be able to go to a, a, a subspecialist and get that communication enhanced. It is um, it is a real effort because we you know we have to start with a smaller group of early adopters um, for their medical records. Uh, also, there's a lot of effort involved with the whole HIPAA and everything else. But that's one of the things um, we started here in Hawaii in terms of our PCMH efforts. That's great to hear. I see um, Kate Orville has her hand up. Uh, Kate's in Washington, and uh, Washington State over the last few years in particular has been working on developing better coordination of care for children on the autism spectrum. Um, Kate, what comments have you got for us? Thank you, Dan. I was thrilled to see you were also on this call. Um, yes, I, I'm with the Medical Home Partnerships Project, which is funded by the Department of Health in Washington State and the University of Washington had combating autism grants. Um, and through that, and with Dan Corey's help at one of our summits, we figured out a process to um, bring um, not just the physicians, but also you know, families and all the community services involved with identifying and caring for kids with special needs together to figure out within a particular community what are the uh, resources and services for those families and what's missing and then what does the community prioritize. So I was really um, thrilled, Chris, to hear you talking about how integrally you include the community resources and the families as part of that care coordination and recognizing that it isn't just the physicians, because I think physicians get overwhelmed with all they're asked to do. And if we don't really make it a medical home neighborhood, that everybody is caring, that the physicians really can't do it and the families can't do it. So then do you have um, sort of region-specific uh, sort of ideas, like in, you know, around XYZ town, these are the resources for autism, for asthma, for other things? Well, so what, what um, has ended up happening, it's been more around um, actually uh, uh, screening and, diag or, and evaluation and diagnosis, but then okay. the communities, and it's been usually by county, and usually mm -hmm. rural counties, but the communities that have done this um, 
often, you know, they start with making sure that they're getting kids in and looking not just at the doctors doing the screening, but also like Head Start and child care and other community services. And a lot of times physicians have no idea that other people are doing developmental screening. And That's so, right. So sometimes they're holding really, the practices that are doing the developmental screening hold really tight to that because, mm -hmm. you know, they're being told professionally they should, but they but when they realize other people are doing it too, then sometimes there's a sense of, oh, if, you know, if we could pool that information, maybe we don't have to do that if we got reliable results from somebody else. So mm -hmm. it kind and of And if those were acceptable to, to, provide, to uh, care providers too, yeah. Yeah, so it just, it, um, just getting everybody talking in a bigger group or some defined catchment area, I think, um, can be really helpful for collaboration because people don't know what each other are doing. And so I love your idea of starting, you know, you know, the whole variety of levels from easy, you know, to to hard, because um, it is because I think the important thing is to get started. And so doing, you know, one. Uh, visit one patient, whatever, is a great way to start. But I think, you know, you can, a community can make a difference um, working together, trying to organize the whole community uh, to work better. Nice. Thanks. Great. Uh, this, this is Louise again. And I was going to say one of the small efforts uh, in our community here in Hawaii has to engage with the uh, designated care coordinators of our health plans. Uh, so that we've uh, provided training for them in terms of resources, et cetera, um, and actually bringing um, the care coordinators um, from our, especially our um, um, Medicaid um, health plans. We have um, HMO groups here to come, you know, to have them participate in a, a role that they are already assigned to do, you know, is to work with uh, families uh, and PCP. Very good. Thanks, uh, Louise.